Rebecca and Under Bodhi. And uh, I think most of you are probably familiar with her, but she's a very senior bhikkhuni, um, been ordained a very long time as a nun since I think, was it in the 80s? And uh, no, 1995, 90, I took um, the 10 precepts and 92, the eight precepts. Yeah. Okay. Spent a long time training in Amravati, so I was originally from Wales, a fellow Brit, and uh, and then was it two thousand and nine that you went over to? Mm -hmm. So they were invited yes, by thanks the... to Jill Boone actually, who's on the call. Jill and Co of the Sarnalok Foundation. Thanks to them, we were invited over here. Yeah, I'm supported to be here. Forest Monastery, uh, about an hour from Sacramento in uh, California, Northern California. And I've been privileged enough to stay there twice now for a few months. And uh, it's really an inspiration for me and the kind of community I'd like to develop here. So that continues to be a model. And, uh, and I am an underbody is also one of our advisors on the trust. So, and also to me personally. So if I need some sort of um, mentoring or just a good friend to talk to you know someone else who knows the struggles and the joys of being a bikini I often uh, call upon her so it's really lovely to have you here Aya and thank you for your support to me and to the whole community um, and I'll hand over to you. Thank you thank you Aya Chanda so it's very lovely to be back and uh, connected in with Anukampa and I really you know I think Aya Chanda is is a pretty amazing Nun, you've landed with a good nun over there in the UK. She's uh, so dedicated to the practice and incredibly hardworking and and generous hearted and just really beautiful being. So I'm really delighted to mm. be able to support the project and to be able to connect in with with the Anukampa community. And and I also want to say that um, this uh, Aya Chandra asked me, you know, shall we like. So uh, with the dana aspect of the of the day of, the, of this teaching, shall we, you know, put up both of our websites? And I said, no, I'd like all donations to go to Anukampa. So just that you know that this is a, a support for the Anukampa project and a support for everybody's practice. So that's the framework. <clears throat> and I wanted to speak today about uh, Samma Sankapa, right thought or attuned thought. It's the second fold of the eightfold path. And I'm gonna be, uh, as part of that, I'm gonna be drawing on the um, teachings from this book, The First Free Women. And this is like, um, I, I like to call it a radical translation of the Teri Gata. The Teri Gata are the, the verses of the elder nuns of the Buddha's time, the awakened nuns. And this is a very unusual rendition, interpretation, you know, it's just difficult to find the right words. It's not a, it's not a literal translation, um, but the, <clears throat> the person who translated it is a good friend, became a good friend actually through, through the working on the book and uh, is um, proficient in Pali and uh, has a, like a 20 years of meditation practice and went back to the original texts and sort of digested them and um, brought them out in a, in a very different way to uh, just a literal translation. So, you know, so some some people will say, oh, this isn't good, this isn't a proper translation, and others will go, wow, this is really accessible. So I was one of the, the wow people when I first read the, the manuscript of this book, and uh, I helped get it into um, the format it is now, into, into, into a, a published accessible book because I felt when I first read the manuscript I felt like this is a these are beautiful teachings that really go straight to the heart and I'd like them to be available to people so it's already since February on its fourth reprint so it's obviously it is speaking to people which is wonderful and uh, I want to draw on a few poems so each of the poems in this book are and, and in the Telegata there are 73 poems and um, they are they are each uh, like the voice of a bhikkhuni, one of the awakened bhikkhunis of the Buddha's time. So I'm going to start with the poem of Tisa, the third. And uh, <clears throat> I don't know, it's, it's a succinct little poem, but it just fits. 
Why stay here in your little dungeon? If you really want to be free, make every thought a thought of freedom. Break your chains, tear down the walls, then walk the world a free woman. Why stay here in your little dungeon? If you really want to be free, make every thought a thought of freedom. Break your chains, tear down the walls, then walk the world a free person, woman, man, being. So this is a, such a beautiful, simple teaching on how we can get, you know, how we can get stuck in the dungeons of our minds, you know, and I think now, I'm not sure if the UK is in lockdown at this time, but they're, you know, again, going in and out of lockdown and, and it can maybe even feel like a dungeon, you know, you're stuck at home, you can't go anywhere, you can't see people and, and you're stuck there with your own mind, with the old, old habits, those old thoughts, those old memories and, and it starts to get, a, can start to get a bit dungeon-like. You start to find lurking corners that you haven't gone to before for a long time and, and feel a little trapped. So uh, Tissa is pointing to how, yeah, we can, we can get stuck in those, those little dungeons of our mind. And uh, if we can turn our thoughts around to make every thought a thought of freedom, it's kind of a radical statement, make every thought a thought of freedom. Then we start to literally, you know, break down the walls of our mind, break the chains of our old conditioning, and uh, and then we can and then we can, you know, as we do that work, we start to feel more free. And it's you know, in this in this poem, it's her enlightenment poem. So it's like breaking the chains, breaking down the walls. It's uh, it's 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 opening it right up, and and it may not feel like that immediately it might feel like a little bit less bound, a little bit more free, a little bit more comfortable, a little bit less uh, uh, pulled by our old habits of mind. Uh, but then little by little, if we keep working at it, it does, you know, radical shifts can change, can happen. So in the eight, Noble Eightfold Path, you know, the, the first fold of the path is uh, right understanding or right intention. Right understanding, and then the second fold of the path is is right thought. And there's many different translations for those words. Sam, sama sankapa. I like. I actually like right thought and uh, or attuned thought. So sama, one of the translations of sama can be attuned, just as you uh, tune an instrument, or or you could say attuned to the dhamma. So we get to. So the, the practice is to turn our attention back to the thoughts and um, get to know them and start to turn them around. And I realized I was actually meant to start with a meditation. I just dived straight into the teaching. I think I did that last time. So, uh, so that's, anyway, that's the kind of framework of the, of the topic, I guess. And yeah, I'm kind of, I guess I'm enthusiastic to talk about it. So, so let's settle down and we can go into some silent meditation. So bringing, finding a posture, finding, getting a seat and a posture that's Comfortable enough. Where you, you can have a straight spine as best as you can, not forcing, but also you know, energized, but not uh, tight, not too much energy, not too, not too loose. So you find that place of balance. Take a few deep breaths, 
Breathing in and then letting go. Just being aware of your body sitting here, letting yourself fully arrive here, fully be present here. Being aware of the body breathing, just touching into that present reality present experience. So the thoughts of freedom that Tissa referred to are thoughts of letting go, thoughts of kindness, benevolence, and thoughts of compassion, care. So maybe as you sit, all thoughts just drop away. Then you don't need to worry about bringing up any thoughts. But just in case, as you're sitting here, a thought or two or three or four might be going through your mind. Just be aware of what what kind of a thought, you know, are they are they are these thoughts of doubt or judgment or criticism or fear or you know, just be aware of what is the, the mood of the mind and what are the kind of thoughts that are that are being entertained. Often we, they're happening without us noticing until we sit and, and quiet in the mind and get more still. So if you find that the mind is busy or restless or confused or concerned, or upset. Just invite a letting go, a sense of care. We're just sitting for these few minutes, it's not it's not hours. And so whatever is occupying the mind can be let go of right now. Let it go. Just bringing awareness to your breath, the body breathing. Letting go.
So what a blessing that we have, you know, have some, uh, that the Buddha has passed down these teachings and also the, the practice. I know for myself, when I first started to meditate, uh, it was such, in a, in a way, quite a shock to see what my mind was doing, to actually kind of turn back the attention back to this own mind and see like, oh my goodness, you know, full of uh, criticism and judgment and desire and confusion. And, and then there would be these moments of where it would all just drop away, just, just for little glimpses in the meditation, we just drop away and there was just peace. And this, and that was for me like, uh, it was like um, most delicious. You know, it's like, oh, this is this is possible. We don't have to be uh, tyrannized by our minds. And so, first of all, I, you know, it was it was uh, I was seeking that through meditation. And then, you know, as we deepen the practice, you realize like, well, meditation is part of it, and how we're living is part of it. You know, how we're how, how I'm actually relating to the situations that arise and, and the people who I'm with and the, the, the environment I'm in, you know, is how, how I actually relate to that is a huge part of the path. And the meditation is also a huge part. The meditation is like a, um, a deeply transformative part of the, of the path. And then there's the sort of more of the, the nitty gritty of how we're living in the world. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, it can take some time to even, even see sometimes uh, what, what our mind is doing because we're, we're in it, you know, we're in that, we've done it for years. It's what we grew up in and it's what we've been doing. And the, the, the tendencies and the habits of the mind can just be so normal to us that we don't even notice that we're, operating from a, a place of criticism for example I know people who are more perfectionist oriented I'm not so much that way myself but those who have that perfectionist streak you know that, that it can be really inspiring and beautiful to to see and then but there's an edge you know where it goes too far and then it's just this kind of relentless um expectation for for what is imperfect to become perfect so everything is is perfectly imperfect. It's all it's all flux. It's all in a state of flux. Things are changing all the time, and uh, you know nothing. That this idea of perfection is the way we think of perfection is not real. This idea of things coming to a perfect, you know, the perfect relationship, the perfect meditation, the perfect life. You know, it's it's perfection is is the is being present with change. Is knowing the the constant changing nature of things. That's that's perfection. It's not in fixing something in a certain way. So if you have that leaning of, of um, you know wanting things to be a certain way and trying to keep them that way, you might notice that uh, in doing that, uh, dukkha arises. It gets it gets stressful because you can't sustain it. It's not sustainable. So we might enjoy a little moment of perfection here and there. And, and uh, things exactly the way we think they should be here and there, and then it changes. So the perfection is being okay with, with that changing nature of things, to be interested in it, to be present with it, and letting go. So the, the critical mind it wants to kind of get everything lined up and the way it should be, and, and uh, life generally doesn't uh, comply too well with that way of doing things. Or you may be very, you know, like a greed type. I'm sort of a little bit more that way myself. You know, always wanting something nice, something different, something new, something beautiful, something delightful, wanting everything to be, everyone to be friends and everything to be easy, you know, let's make it nice. And, and then for the greed type, you know, it's like it's an endless, it's an endless search. You're always wanting more. <clears throat> it's never quite enough. It's never long enough. It's never good enough. It's never, or it's or it's good, but you want another one or or the next thing, you know. And that's that's the the nature of greed. Always looking for something else, something better, something more. And uh, 
So the, the thought of freedom to bring to a greedy mind is thoughts of letting go. Thoughts of renunciation is sometimes it's translated that way. It sounds a little severe, renunciation, but thoughts of letting go. So when the mind is, is filled with wanting, just to bring in the thought, what if I were to just let go? What if I were to just let go of that wanting and be present and curious and interested in how things are right now? Instead, turn towards things as they are instead of always wanting something more. And uh, if you are a greed type, you might notice, you know, that even when you get what you want, the greed sort of blurs the mind. So you get what you want and then you're not quite there when it's happening because you because the mind is, is still in that mode of more, more, more. So then and then it's then it's over and then it's like, oh, hang on a minute. Where were, I missed it. You know, it can be like that. So uh, getting to know, getting to know the mind, getting to know the nature of your mind and uh, really well, you know, not being embarrassed, not being embarrassed like, oh, I wish I, I shouldn't really be greedy because I'm a Buddhist. You know, greed arises in the unenlightened mind. Aversion arises in the unenlightened mind. Confusion arises in the unenlightened mind. That's how it is. It's not personal, actually. It's just those those uh, those qualities, poisons, uh, tendencies, whatever you want to call them, will come in until we've freed the mind completely, as Tissa is pointing to. And we can. There is there is the possibility to free the mind, but we have to understand the, the the trap that we create for ourselves through habitual thinking, through particular ways of thinking that we've been conditioned in. So some of the conditioning is what we came in with, our tendencies, and some of it is the environment we've grown up in or that we're in now that shapes it. So we have to kind of get to know, get to know our mind and not be afraid to see what we might not want to see. So it's really important not to take it all too personally on and not to be too upset about any of it. You know, it's like all kinds of stuff can go on in the mind. And then we just need to know it and guide it in the right direction. Um, so if you agree type, it's thoughts of, of letting go. And if you're a, an, an ill will type, always seeing what's wrong and criticizing and judging, and um, then the the thought of freedom is thoughts of kindness, metta, thoughts of benevolence. So that's like a softening and accepting kindness, a friend, a befriending things as they are instead of always wanting them to be otherwise. And, uh, you know, basically things are as they are, things are as they are, and then we want it like this or we don't want it like that. And so we create... Uh, complexity we make it more complicated than it needs to be things are as they are and then we can we can what we do have agency over we can't make the world right we can't uh, you know we can't we can't even you know change somebody we care about to be the way we think they should be even even if it's like trying to guide them in the right direction we can't always you know you can you can lay out the, the conditions for that to happen but you can't make it happen so you know we we can't control the world to be the way we think it should be but we can guide and uh, understand our own minds so and we you know controlling the mind isn't the way either sometimes we do need to sort of take the reins and pull it in a different direction if it's going off the you know going off the rails if we're going off the rails, but often it's just about listening and understanding. We need to understand our mind more. We need to understand where 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 is this coming from? What's underneath this 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 uh, this wanting and not wanting? And then there's confusion also. Confusion. You need you need uh, to develop clarity. But the the third um, thought uh, like. Un unhelpful thought is the thoughts of harm, thoughts of wishing, thoughts of harmfulness, wishing harm on others. And this can come about when, you know, when we're afraid or when we feel we really want to get our way and we're not getting our way. 
uh, often fear is underneath thoughts of harm. It, it can be fear, it could also be a kind of greed, it can also be like wanting to dominate, wanting to have control. I think uh, it's not, uh, not so often a strong quality in the people who turn up at meditation teachings, but it can, it's definitely out there in the world, the, the wish to dominate and control and have things one's own way. And then when that isn't happening, then we want to crush, yeah. harm, get rid of. So just noticing, or, or it can be that we have harmful thoughts towards ourselves. You know, we're not, and we're not, we haven't accepted ourselves as we are. We don't, uh, there's not enough love there for this, this imperfect being that we live with every day. So uh, getting to know, you know, if, if you have those thoughts, harmful thoughts, wishing harm on oneself, on yourself or on others, really be aware that that's, it's in itself is harmful. It's going to harm you. And if you're not careful, it can harm others. So you don't want to go that route. That's the, that's the route to endless suffering. So um, getting to know those thoughts, if they arise in you and finding a way of restraining this a restraint so you're not going to do any harm and then transforming those thoughts care you know listening understanding expanding your view to accommodate a, a broader picture so we need to use our discernment to see what's actually going on here and then also to see, well, how do, what's the skillful response to this? And, uh, you know, I think the precepts are also very, very important. The five precepts, very important support for the practice. And they, they stop us from doing harm. So that they're also very, very important. You know, they, they stop us from doing harm for it to ourselves through, um, you know, to ourselves and others, you know, lying and... Uh, abstaining from lying, abstaining from killing, abstaining from uh, sex misconduct, abstaining from stealing, abstaining from getting drunk, stoned, you know, getting inebriated where we don't really know what we're doing. So then we're care taking care of this being. And it can take a while, you know, not everybody, maybe not everyone on the call is, is uh, living by those yet. It took me a while to align with them. From my life before and but it really is a supportive framework for the practice and it stops us from from hurting ourselves and hurting others it's a it's a it's, a, it's kind of a noble and and uh, uplifting practice to keep the precepts so uh, yeah so there are many ways that uh, we can use thought in a careless way and then from thought comes speech and, and, and action and then we start finding ourselves doing things and saying things that we regret and you know and that as part of the training that that's what happens you know first of all we want to get clear like what you know what do we want to do have if we do i want to cultivate the path do i want to cultivate right thought do i want to change the way the, the habits of this being change the course the direction of this life to a, in a, a more, a direction that leads to freedom. And if the answer is yes, then, you know, then we start training and we start paying attention to the way that our thoughts are going. And, uh, and understand, bringing understanding. So I notice there are certain, there are certain things that I'll fall into again and again. And it might be, it might be that it's, uh, things are going well and everything's okay. And then suddenly, boom, fall into this, it's like a pit, you know, so like, oh. and there'll be this pit and it's very, very believable. It's like there'll be, there'll be stories of, you know, um, mm. so I, I mean, I get to my stories of something along the lines, it's, it's a line, you know, it's something along the lines of the world would be a better place if you weren't in it. So that's my little line. That's my Mara that comes up. The world would be a better place if you weren't in it. And it's, it's amazing how, how believable it can be when it comes up. So as I said, it's kind of, I want to laugh because it's kind of like, I know that that's complete rubbish. But uh, when it comes up, it's like, oh, that's true. And then I can start to see all these, all these put together all these little stories that make that real. 
that make and then or or even like oh a look of a horror would be much better if I wasn't here I should just move on you know that these these little things and um and then they can be very believable for for a little while not for too long and then I start to reflect you know then so there can be the stories if you just go with the old patterning it's very early patterning it's something that was conditioned and I know the story so it's it's kind of it's in the spotlight so it's, it's like Mara is seen you could say I can see the, the conditioning um but then there'll be you know when there isn't proper full awareness they'll be dropping into that and then the stories that support that that's that uh, thought and then at some point there's like hang on a minute is this really true? Is that real? And then, and then, in investigating it, it's like there's no, there's no substance to that. No, it's not real. And it might take a little while, but uh, one can pull apart those, those stories. And you might have a line that that is your line. That uh, you know, some people have the "I'm not good enough." Well, a lot of people have actually and that, and that might be for different reasons it might be like I'm not smart I'm not intelligent enough or I'm not um strong enough or I'm you know whatever it might be there's all sorts of things that we think that we, that that we put together that tell us that we're not enough but the thing is we're here like this we have manifested like this right now this, this, so what's how can we be how can it be wrong <laughs> it is like this and uh, this morning we we're just reflecting on how you know this this body and mind is is part of nature and we take it very very personally you know? and this is one of the things the buddha is pointing us to like when we take this this process of, of body mind personally there is suffering suffering arises because it's not really personal, it's, it's a process that we have some agency over, we can guide it, but the, our body is doing its thing. I can't tell it what to do, it's doing its thing. I can move it around a bit and do, you know, feed it the right things and exercise and breathe good air and that kind of stuff. But basically it's, it's an incredible complex process of nature doing what it's doing. And then the mind, the mind also has, has you know, the nature of the mind is to, think and to um, get busy with with thoughts that is the nature of the mind and but what we can do is we can guide the thoughts in a direction that leads to freedom and away from more and more suffering and so it said that on the when the buddha was um you know in those days leading up to his enlightenment uh, he recognized that the, that his thoughts would could go into two two directions those thoughts thoughts of desire thoughts of uh, ill will and thoughts of harm and then there are thoughts of letting go thoughts of kindness and thoughts of care of compassion and that they would sort of go in this direction or that direction and then that the, the one had a choice if there's a tension there's a choice in which way we let our thoughts go so uh I think it's it's often underestimated the power of thought that you know, how how deeply that influences our life, the way we let our thoughts take over and uh, the way we get pushed around by our thoughts. And I've noticed you know, living as a, a nun, I meet many people and and you know many good people. And uh, when I say good people, I don't mean like absolutely perfect who never do anything wrong. I, in fact, I don't think I've ever met anyone like that. But um, good people, people with goodness in their hearts. And often those people are saying to me, oh, you know, I'm, I'm so bad because of this, or I can't do because of that. And often people fall into those places where things are not well, you know, there's no sense of not, not well in oneself. And so uh, we, we can do something about that, each of us. You know, not, not, we can't change another person's mind. We can help guide people, but we can change our own mind. So whether it's uh, greed and, and creating stories of, of uh, more, 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 or whether it's uh, a strong idea of, of who and what we are, or whether it's, uh, whether our thoughts are thoughts of, of criticism and uh, putting down ourselves or others, 
if once we know that we can we can change those thoughts we can do something about it and part of it is in daily life and part of it is in our meditation practice so in meditation we can develop the qualities of letting go we can develop the qualities of metta beautiful quality we can develop the quality of compassion you know these are these are qualities we can develop not just in the thoughts but also in the heart and in the mind as a mood as, a, as, a, as an energy and uh, even the even the best people the kindest people the most generous people i've known drop into those places so you know you have to take care I just want to read this beautiful poem. It's, it's Mitta. It's just, this poem has been coming to me like a mantra, actually. We've been having some retreat time here. And I'd find this poem coming up like a mantra, just going through my mind. And it's uh, Mitta, friend. Full of trust, you left home and soon learned to walk the path. Making yourself a friend to everyone and making everyone a friend. When the whole world is your friend, fear will find no place to call home. And when you make the mind your friend, you'll know what trust really means. Listen, I have followed this path of friendship to its end. And I can say with absolute certainty, it will lead you home. So I love that, um, I love the whole poem actually, but I love that line, when you make the mind your friend, you'll know what trust really means. So when I first read this poem, I felt like, oh, it's far from my life. You know, I didn't feel like, I didn't feel like my first leaving home, you know, like from, as a, as a teenager, it wasn't full of trust. And I didn't make the world my friend and, and everybody wasn't my friend. I was kind of, you know, wasn't like that. And, uh, and so I felt like, oh, I can't really relate to that poem. But, but then as time went by, I started to reflect on it more. It started to come to me actually like a mantra. And um, there was a second leaving home when I ordained. And that really was full of trust, leaving home, going forth full of trust. And, and it was making a friend to everyone and gradually making uh, a friend to my own mind. And... Uh, you know, that's it. When we when we make the mind our friend, there's a, there's a place to rest. It doesn't matter what's going on. It doesn't matter what thoughts are arising. Actually, if we've really got to know our mind the way it is, the tendencies it has, and we've guided it as best we can in the right direction. So there are some things that we can change. There are some things that will change through cultivation and there are some things that may just keep popping up and that's what I've come to accept you know with this mind that there are some things that will just keep popping up because the conditioning is so so old and so part of this personality and and uh, you know think about the Buddha you know who's the, the you know fully enlightened Buddha which is so far from what any of us are we're just like little you know just the very very beginnings learning that the Buddha Mara still came to the Buddha throughout his life and would try to, you know, whisper in his ear to, to pull him off track. And the, and the Buddha would still, you know, even like right before he died, would have to say, I know you, Mara. So that's our work too. We have to learn to say, I know you, Mara. I know that, I know that thought that that's not, I know that thought that that's not me, it's not mine, it doesn't belong here. It's not real. And then if we can do that, we can relax. We can trust, we can feel safe where we are. And uh, the safety isn't because, uh, because we've, we've uh, living you know, in, a, in a barricaded house where nothing can get in. It's, it's uh, because we're occupying this space with clarity and awareness and, and kindness. Mm -hmm. So when those uh, unwelcome thoughts arise, as intrusive thoughts arise, we know them. And even if they take over for a little while, sooner or later we, we, we recognize it and then we patiently, kindly escort them out. 
and replace them with, with care, with kindness, with letting go. So it's a practice and it's a beautiful practice and it's uh, sometimes a little scary because we do have to meet the whole gamut that's in there and so you know developing this quality of awareness and developing our meditation practice and particularly developing awareness and and kindness metta is is very very important and having that framework of support of the sila of the of ethics these are really, really important and they will support us. And as Mita says, I have followed this path of friendship to his end. So she's a, an awakened one. And I can say with absolute certainty, it will lead you home. So home is that place of safety, that place of rest, place of freedom. I just want to offer that this today and uh, and then I'd like to open up the, the Zoom for any sharing or any questions that anyone might have. Okay. Thank you very much for Ayan and the Bodhi for the beautiful meditation and reflection. So I just wanted to remind people in case anyone joined uh, a little bit late that these questions will be recorded but we won't record your face or your video uh, it'll be just your voice um, if you're not comfortable with that then please feel free to drop your question in the chat box there's a little button at the bottom of your screen if you hover your icon there you can click on the chat and pop it in the chat box and I will um, read that out for Venerable Ananda Bodhi okay uh, if you do want to ask the question yourself then the best way for us to find you is to go to the participants button and in there you'll get um, some kind of, huh? <laughs> I always get this wrong. There's something that says raise hand, I think, and then you get a little hand that comes up on the screen and we'll be able to um, find you and unmute you and we'll mention your name. I think Anne-Marie is kindly offered to organise that, so she will announce when it's your turn to ask the question. Okay. Or it doesn't have to be a question, it can be anything that you'd like to share. While we're waiting for uh, questions, I'd love for us to offer a short reflection because um, I found that such a helpful talk, uh, Aya and Ananda Verdi, really. It was just amazing because I'm often judging myself because I because some of these unhelpful thoughts come up and I feel like I should have mastered that by now so to hear you uh with your your experience um share that that still happens for yourself as well I just found that really comforting um and and just really really helpful to know it I almost felt myself relax a little bit um taking the effort away so I just wanted to say thank you very much I found it a really wise and helpful talk thank you that's lovely thank you Mel I'm really happy to hear that yeah it's uh yeah it's being human so it looks like Nilanti has a question. Uh, hello. Um, I have a simple okay. question. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, and uh, when I meditate, uh, when my breath is settled down and I don't feel my breath and I... Uh, I feel my body vibration. After that, uh, I can see pictures and sounds I can hear. But some point, uh, some time is like, I don't feel anything. Is that time is like missing. I don't know what happened, but I'm pretty sure I didn't sleep. Okay. It's happened um, sometimes every day, but I don't know how long it is. But... Uh, 
I don't know, it's some minutes or some seconds or something. It's like, uh, is that normal or? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, just the mind is, the mind is, uh, is letting go. It's, the mind's letting go and it's, uh, you're abiding in a peaceful state, it sounds like. This okay. is uh, skillful. Yeah. Thank you very much. Very much it's like really inspired your talk and it's like really, really. Thank you very much. So do I need to do something when it's happened? Because uh, all the time when uh, after that, that uh, loss period, uh, it start uh, feeling breath again. Yeah, it's like a wake up kind of thing. So. It might be, you know, different people may give you different answers. So I, I'm going to say, and I'd like to invite Ajahnda also to, to weigh in, but... Uh, you know what what in the way that i've been trained in the way i practice it would be to know just to know so to know when the mind has gone into that place of uh, of really like deep letting go and, and to know if it is if that is the case or whether it, one has just kind of zoned out or gone to sleep you know they're different they're very different there's yeah, a different it's really very different clarity okay. and then to know that it changes you know and see is there any is there any attachment is there any greed is there any um, you know, is, is it is it okay to let that go and move on to the next thing, to to be more with the with the changing nature, to be more aware of the change. So that's the way my training has been: is to to know the state that is present and and cultivate what is wholesome and keep letting go. I don't think it's the time to start doing because it sounds as though you've got to that peaceful state by a lot of letting go. So sometimes because we're unfamiliar with that territory, we feel like, uh oh, where am I? Who am I? And it's very natural for this sense of the doer to want to come back in. But actually, you've managed to arrive at that peaceful state through letting go. So um, if the breath is coming back naturally after some time, that suggests to me that yeah, you're just in slightly unfamiliar territory, but after a while, your mindfulness will kind of brighten up and you'll be able to see more the, more going on in that place. Um, and the only other thing I would say is uh, that you'll probably know the difference between whether it was a sleep state or just a peaceful state by how you feel after the meditation. So if you feel quite groggy and, you know, like you need to have a, a strong coffee, then maybe you did kind of fall asleep and lost your awareness. But if you feel quite peaceful and, and fresh and maybe even energized, then it's probably that a letting a state of letting go. So I think it's just a matter of getting familiar and like I said, just remaining aware of whatever's happening. The next question is from Daisy. Hi, there was one more question in the chat, so I didn't want to override this one, but um, I wanted to first thank you very much for a very inspiring and very um, unlocking session for unlocking a lot of uh, new things and more serene thoughts. And I wanted to ask you if you have any particular advice on the letting go which uh, for me is one of the things that uh, I am working on. So are there any particular um, phrases or mantras or I wouldn't call it even techniques in terms of how to let go or when we see or when I see this arising that you have found particularly helpful to then use in those cases in order to, to facilitate letting go? Yeah, there's a few. I mean, it really depends on what's going on. You know, if it's something really intense, very strong, then I then, you know, let go, let go. <laughs> and sometimes I used to use the use the phrase release the grip, mm -hmm. release the grip. And then that would make me see like, where where is the holding? Release the grip. And then it was like, oh, yeah, where's the holding there? Why is there? There's like a the mind is like a fist. Release the grip. And then that just to invite that gradual opening. 
And uh, if it's something more subtle, then, or even if it's bodily, sometimes it'll be like a bodily feeling that's tension. This morning, actually, we had a, a meeting in the morning and then I had quite a lot to do and I knew I was going to be here online and, and I had this very strong sense of pressure. It was like uh, urgency, pressure. And then you know, when we start with a little check-in how we are. And so I was like, well, I'm feeling all this pressure. And so I'm going to invite that energy to, to, to ground, to come down. So sometimes it's just knowing the, the, the movement of the, the energy or of the mind and then countering that. So then as I, as, I, as I invited that energy to not be pushing this way, but to come down into the ground, down through the body into the ground, the letting go happened naturally. And there was a coming into, into a you know, centeredness. And, uh, and then some things need to be investigated before we can let them go. So that some things will come up again and again. Um, and that can be because it's a habit of mind. And so you can explore, you know, the, the Buddha does encourage us to, to uh, explore. It's not just like do this or do that. Um, Dhamma Vijaya investigation is, is one of the awakening factors. So, so we can, you know, if, if something comes up and you recognize, oh, it's that thing again, oh, it's that thing again, you can see whether you can just replace it with another, another intention or whether you can let go with the breath uh, you know, with it, with the out breath, out breath is lovely for letting go. And if that's, and then if it keeps coming up, what I found is sometimes things keep coming up because they want to be understood. So then to turn towards them and, and get interested and see whether you can see what it is. It's like, a, I experience it like a listening. So it's not uh, like that so much, although some people might do it that way. It's more like a, a relationship and listening and like a, a taking interest in like, oh, what do you want to tell me? Okay, well, I, I'm listening now. What, what do you want to tell me? And then, and then, just staying with it until whatever it is wants to be, that wants to be heard is is heard. Or you know, sometimes it might just be a word, or a, or even an image, or a memory. And then sometimes once it's just become aware, conscious, it it lets go on its own. So it's so uh, it's an interesting practice because we can't control all of this stuff. You know that it's not like we can get it all under control. But and there are some things that we can trans transform through. Um, you know, through bringing in different in different thoughts, different uh, intentions, and there are some things that we just need to listen to, and get interested in, and understand, and then that letting go happens. And in terms of the desire, greed, and desire, yeah, yeah wanting, especially desire of things and people, then it's probably <laughs> also listening and getting interested into why that arises i would assume or it can be that can be part of it so there can be emotional reasons why why there's attachment in that way there's desire there can be like a, a need an unmet need that, that one's seeking for and it can also just be plain old desire you know somebody's attractive and, and you, have, you have desire for them and i mean in the in the buddhist in, in the monastic form you know what we is because we're celibate we have these practices of uh, asuba like getting to know the, the unbeautiful aspect. So, you know, you look at like, what is it that's attractive? Well, it's such, you know, like the hair and the skin and the mood, the way the person moves. And, and, then it, and then you look at like, okay, hair, you know, it's like even just reflect on your own hair. If you don't wash your hair for two weeks, is it attractive or is it kind of smell like a sheep and, and look a bit <laughs> greasy, you know, and skin, Oh, it's such beautiful skin, and it's like well, skin. It's like flaking off all the time, and uh, you know, it it'll it'll get all wrinkly and blotchy as we get older. And uh, again, if we don't wash it, it's going to smell bad very quick. So you know, it's it's like looking at the other side of things. So it's not, and it's not to be repulsed, but it's to see the the whole picture, and also contemplation of death. I found that very helpful is just recognizing we're all we're all going to die and, and what the things that I want I'm going to have to be parted from. I remember um, one of the nuns I lived with in, in the UK she you know I was always because I'm agreed to so I was always trying to kind of give things up and renounce it was always like a real battle you know in the early years really struggling with this and struggling with that and, and then she said all those things you work so hard to to let go of you're going to have to be parted from anyway. 
you're going to have to let them go anyway. And it was like, oh, yeah. You know, the, the, the idea of them being mine in the first place is the problem. <laughs> they, never, they never were, they're never going to be. So, so um, you know, in the Buddha with, with desire, he, he encouraged us to know the, the gratification so that he you know, acknowledges, yes, there's gratification when ple pleasant things are gratifying. The danger, the danger is that they change. They can't be gratifying for very long. And the escape, and the escape is letting go. So it's using wisdom and reflection and, uh, and discernment and knowing like, what do I want to follow and what do I not want to follow? And then there's the wholesome, wholesome desire, chanda. The desire of uh, the zeal, you know, the desire for, for awakening, the desire for liberation, the desire to cultivate wholesome states, the desire for, uh, you know, developing the power, the desire to be generous, the desire to, you know, offer something of benefit to the world. These are these are wholesome desires. They lead to greater freedom. But uh, desire for, you know, nice things is an endless, endless process. Um, I, if it's okay for you, we'll go to a question from the chat box now, so I can read that out for you. So, have you any advice on my ill will? When I get upset at someone, in, at someone, my mind can get quickly offended and my heart hardens and I look at the person in an unkind way. Please help as I really don't like my anger and I know how harmful it can be. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a, there's a lot of good material there. So first of all, you, you, there's a lot of awareness. So you can see, you can, you're describing the process really clearly. So you can really see what's going on. That's awesome as a beginning. And there's a wish to, to transform it. So it's like, awesome, awesome. Um, you know, it's, it's much harder when, we, when we're justifying, we're blaming, we're, we're, we're right and they're all wrong. You know, when we're in that state, then we, we can't even get started. So you're already, you're already a good ways down the road in, in the right direction. And then, uh, and the way you described actually the, that your heart hardens, that's, there's a lot of clarity there. That's, that's very, very good to know it. And that it's dukkha, you know, you don't want that. It's unpleasant. So, you know, the, the, I think wise reflection is a really, an important part of, of all of this practice. And so with wise reflection, we see things don't go the way I want. <laughs> People aren't the way I think they should be. They're not relating the way I think they should be relating. So it's like when we start to see those, you know, it's like, so I think it should be this way, but it isn't. And that's a cause of dukkha. So it can be that just as simple as that. Sometimes it's, uh, it's as simple as that, that we let go of our idea that it should be a certain way. And, uh, and then there's, you know, using also discernment to to protect oneself so if you, you don't want to be with people you don't want to spend a lot of time with people who are you know harmful bullying uh, degrading you know you, you don't want to be you, you want to protect yourself to not to have to be exposed too much to people who are um going to bring up unwholesome states like that but if so so you know if the person is is bringing out a lot of unwholesome stuff manifesting a lot of unwholesome stuff themselves be careful you know and if you're if it's somebody you work with then you know work with them and then have your boundaries um and then there's so there's the boundaries i think is a very very important part of it that you're not going to just let yourself be overwhelmed by all that stuff. And then uh, and the precepts again, you know, you're not gonna do anything harmful. So it sounds like that's not really in the picture for you, which is great. And then it's like coming back and working with your own heart and mind. So if, you, if you're able to, have, to, to develop boundaries, then it's easier to work with what arises in the heart. And when your boundaries are poor, then it's hard because you're, you're, you're so affected by everything. And so you're sort of trying to control it all out there when really you need to sort of say, okay, you know, only this far, and then you take care of what's here. So that uh, hardening of the heart, 
the problem with you know when our heart hardens is that uh, we you know the whole of our being kind of hardens and then and we become more of a target actually when our heart is hard we're either we either feel like people are either afraid of us or they see us as a you know something that they can bang up against and when the heart is open it's like there's nothing to there's nowhere for things to land so uh there can be a just a very conscious pr uh, practice in meditation of you know when you're alone when you're not in that situation uh, you can like uh, bring to mind the the situation you are in in that moment in your meditation so you like maybe you're at home in a in your room or something and things are, are safe enough and it's okay so you don't need to be afraid you don't need to defend yourself you don't need to be angry there's nothing really happening and uh and then bring up in your mind that situation that that made the heart close, that made you angry and upset, and see whether you can soften around it and open it. So I'm not encouraging you to dwell in it and, and, and cultivate lots of unwholesome wholesome thoughts, but bring it up enough that you know how that feels again and see whether in that safe environment that you're in, whether you can soften your heart to that person, whether you can even hear them, what they were, what they were needing or what they were expressing what the, what was underneath what they were saying and uh, and whether you can open your heart soften your heart a little bit um and you know and then without the without the scenario of the people and the and the situation in meditation practice developing the radiant metta practices is really really powerful the, the all the brahma viharas in the, in the in the radiant form where you're not going through lists of people but you're just literally bringing to mind something that will generate the quality of metta or the quality of karuna or the quality of mudita or the quality of upeka and and staying present with that quality you can use the breath to strengthen it or to stay connected with that and just really develop a, a field of metta in your own being so it's got nothing to do with stories or people. It's, it's, it's a quality that you develop in your heart and in your mind. And that changes you. And that also changes the way you manifest in the world. And that changes the way you relate. And it can change other people. But I wouldn't, uh, don't, don't do it for that reason. Because sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. So that's what I would like to say. And it's, it's, and all of these things, they're practices. You know, whether you're working with greed or with aversion or with confusion, with ill with harm or with ill will all of that stuff they're they're practice you have to practice you have to work at it and then at some point you know it's just like climbing a mountain you're going to climb you're climbing you're wondering if it's ever going to get anywhere and then at some point like oh great i can enjoy the view you know until you get to your next mountain i hope that's helpful could i just Jump in because we Please. only have five minutes left, but there's somebody who has had their hand up for a while. So I was wondering, I know you have to go at 1130. Um, I was wondering if we, maybe we would use the last five minutes to invite one more question and okay. we can let you go and do our closing things after that. Okay, thank you. That sounds good. Five minutes. Lovely. All right. Please. Hi. Is that me? Yeah, thank you. Yes. Yes, thank Hi. you. Uh, so more of a reflection than a question, but um, that poem by Tisa is just so wonderful and so beautiful. I've heard it a couple of times now and, and, you know, the first time I heard it just like, whew, you know, such a, such an amazing experience hearing it. And it, it always makes me think back to my very first retreat experience um, a number of years ago that heading into that first retreat experience, having so much anxiety and being so scared because my perception was that it was gonna be just like a dungeon, you know, maybe a dungeon uh, just with fewer distractions in it, you know, and that that <laughs> work. was gonna be stuck in this cell that is my mind. And I have to just like grit my teeth and white knuckle my way through these seven days or whatever it was. Um, which is not necessarily 100% inaccurate, but it, it took me, a few days on retreat before realizing like, oh no, there's a way out. You know, I don't have to be here. 
in this dungeon. I, I, I have the key. I can step out. And yeah. such an amazing, amazing insight. And, um, and yet that still comes up, you know, especially heading into retreats, subsequent retreats since then, that sometimes I'll still get scared of like, oh, but what if this time it is just a dungeon 100% of the time? What if, what if there is no way out this time? Um, and the talk today, you know, hearing the poem again and hearing the reflection today was such a great reminder, you know, that, that there is always this way out of the dungeon, even outside of retreat experience, that there's always this way out. So thank you very much. Good. Yes, so, so important. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> um, and I'm aware that I, uh, Nanda Bodhi will be having her lunch fairly soon. Um, but I just want to really thank you on behalf of everybody here for a really wonderful and inspiring and very practical, very um, relevant and helpful session. I think, you know, always hearing from other people's experience can really bring the teachings to life. And for me too, it was quite mm -hmm. edifying to know that, you know, we all have this happening. This is just part and parcel of being a human being. And the difference with being on the path is that we're aware of what's going on. Mm -hmm. exactly. um, so that was really helpful. And also this um, classic phrase, isn't it? All throughout the suttas of Mara, I know you, you know, mm -hmm. and as soon as Mara is seen, Mara, they say like, shoulders hunched slinks away oh the bikini knows me the bikini knows me <laughs> <laughs> so that applies to all of us it's just seeing these things sometimes can be enough so thank you so much um i would like to offer that you can leave now if you wish i know thank that you. um thank you have to I, I want you to eat well and uh, thank you offer that kindness to your belly as as you have to us so thank you so much you. and um yeah and we'll just finish up with five minutes i'll invite mel to say a few words so thank you very okay, much lovely to be with you all yeah take good care and thank you for supporting i chanda in her beautiful work yeah all right bye bye <laughs>